Lilith, known by legend as Adam's first wife, she was the first woman, before Eve was even created and before the eating of the forbidden fruit in the garden. Lilith is the woman mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, while Eve was the woman mentioned in Genesis chapter 2. Lilith betrayed Adam and became the bride of Satan and the mother of demons. At least, this is the way Lilith was portrayed by some in the early 2nd millennium CE. The story of Lilith, however, dates back thousands of years and spans countless civilizations. And these are her true origins. The astute reader of the first two chapters of Genesis will notice that Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 seem to contain two different accounts of the creation of humankind. For many Jews and Christians today, they do not see these two accounts as different. The explanation often given for this is that Genesis chapter 2 simply expands on the information given in Genesis chapter 1. Biblical scholarship since the early 1900s has taken a slightly different approach to answering this question. The leading theory today among Old Testament scholars as to why there are two different accounts in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is called the documentary hypothesis, which suggests that Moses did not write the Pentateuch, aka the first five books of the Bible. The documentary hypothesis theorizes that the book of Genesis is a composite text made up of many different texts stitched and woven together by several different people over different time periods living in different locations throughout the ancient Near East. But these two explanations have not always been the understanding. Ancient people wondered about this very question as well, and at times they came up with very different theories, and their theories usually came in the form of creating new and expansive stories to fill in the gaps. And by the end of the first millennium CE, there was a perfect opportunity for the legend of Lilith to fill that gap. According to an anonymous Jewish text titled The Alphabet of Ben Sira, dating to the Middle Ages, the reason there is a difference between Genesis 1 and 2 is because there are two very different stories. The first created woman in Genesis 1 wasn't Eve, but an evil demon named Lilith. Eve didn't come into the story until Genesis chapter 2. So who was Lilith, what are her origins, and how did she eventually become viewed as being Adam's first demonic wife? To thoroughly trace the origins and history of Lilith, we must first travel back in time over 5,000 years to one of the most ancient civilizations of all time, the civilization of Sumer. The Sumerian peoples were the first civilization to permanently settle into the land of Mesopotamia, which is located primarily in modern-day Iraq, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The earliest mythology of Lilith was likely born here in Sumerian oral tradition. We know very little of who Lilith might have been during this time period, considering oral tradition is, by definition, oral and not written down. However, scholars believe that the mythology of Lilith must have been originally passed down orally because she, or more accurately, they, feature prominently in later written Sumerian texts. The concept of Lilith first appeared in Sumerian myth in the 3rd millennium BCE and were a class of wind and storm demons called the Lilithu. One of, if not the earliest references of Lilith can be found in the ancient Sumerian text called Inanna in the Halupu tree. This story was likely passed down orally initially until it was eventually written down between 2900 and 2750 BCE. Inanna in the Halupu tree is a wonderful little story about Inki, the Sumerian god of creation and wisdom, who plants a tree near the bank of the Euphrates River. One day, a strong south wind uprooted the tree and blew it into the Euphrates River. As the tree was floating down the river, Inanna, the Sumerian goddess of love, beauty, and sex, plucked the tree out of the river and planted it in her holy garden in the Sumerian city of Uruk. Inanna cared for this tree day and night, wondering how long it would take until the tree was big enough to make for herself a throne and a bed. Ten years passed and the tree was now thick and tall. But then, the text says, then a serpent who could not be charmed made its nest in the roots of the halupu tree. Then Anzu, the bird god, set his young in the branches of the tree. And the dark maid Lilith built her home in the trunk. Inanna, the young woman who loved to laugh, began to weep. Oh, how Inanna wept, yet they would not leave her tree. Then the mighty hero Gilgamesh, yes, the same Gilgamesh from the very popular Epic of Gilgamesh, came in to save the day. 
Gilgamesh came to Inanna's rescue, adorned in his extremely heavy battle armor and wielding a 700-pound bronze axe. Gilgamesh strikes the serpent dead, causing the Anzu bird to fly away. Then Gilgamesh smashed Lilith's home, driving her to flee into the wild, uninhabited wilderness. In this most ancient story of Lilith, she is not yet seen as a demoness per se, but more of a powerful nuisance. All of the gods in the Halupu tree are significant but less prominent Sumerian gods, and this is exactly where Lilith finds her place in the most ancient form of Sumerian mythology. The similarities Lilith has to owls should be rather obvious after reading Inanna in the Halupu tree. Lilith makes her home in the trunk of the tree, just like owls. Then she goes off into the uninhabited wilderness, which is often where owls make their homes. Lilith's name is usually translated as night monster or night creature, but can also be translated as screech owl or little owl. As a matter of fact, the scientific name for the little owl is the Athene Noctua Lilith. And yes, the Athene is named after the Greek goddess Athena. The rock crevices in Athens and the Acropolis in ancient Greece were filled with small owls, believed to be the embodiment of Athena. Scholars believe that many aspects of Athena actually come from ancient stories of Lilith. The Lilithu Sumerian myths could have originated with Lilith being the personification of night owls. This personification in the ancient world almost always comes in the form of deification or becoming a god with an expansive mythology to follow. This can be seen in ancient Egyptian mythology as well, with Sobek as the crocodile god and Horus the falcon-headed god. These definitions and associations between Lilith and owls will be more prominent as we look at our next source for Lilith, which is the book of Isaiah. The only clear reference to Lilith in the entire Bible is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 14. Desert creatures will meet with hyenas, and wild goats will bleat to each other. There the night creatures will also lie down and find for themselves places of rest. That translation was from the NIV, or the New International Version, and the NIV chooses to translate the Hebrew word leleth as night creatures. The King James Version translates it as screech owl, and the NRSV, or the New Revised Standard Version, translates it as lilith. So what's going on here? What does the author of this section of the book of Isaiah really mean when he uses the Hebrew word leleth? Does he really believe in Lilith, the Sumerian storm god and demoness? Historically speaking, here is likely what's going on. The myth of the Sumerian Lilithu had longevity, meaning the mythology of Lilith didn't die out as many myths often do over time. What started in Sumerian mythology continued into Akkadian, Assyrian, and later Babylonian mythology as well. And we know that ancient civilizations shared ideas when two different cultures came into contact with one another. Most of them didn't live in their own little clans with no outside influence. Ancient civilizations came into contact with one another in two different ways, through trade routes and through military conquest. But an interesting thing happens when two cultures cross-pollinate. One culture usually takes the ideas and concepts from another culture and they adapt it and change it slightly to fit in their cultural landscape. This happens all the time in the ancient world, especially in the case of religion and mythologies. So what likely happened is that the mythology of Lilith spread westward via trade routes and military conquests and eventually made its way as far west as the Mediterranean Sea and even beyond. A quick and easy example of this can be seen by taking a look at Inanna, the goddess mentioned in the Halupu tree story. Inanna was Sumerian. She was later known as Ishtar in Babylonian mythology. And then the Canaanites, Hittites, and Egyptians adopted her mythology and called her Astarte. Then her mythology spread as far west as Greece and Rome. The Greeks called her Aphrodite and the Romans Venus. Now, obviously there are some differences between all of these different goddesses. The point I'm trying to make here is that Inanna started it all. She was the blueprint for all of these other goddesses. And when these cultures found out about Inanna, they adopted some of her ideas and changed others to fit in with their cultural and religious sensibilities. That's how things worked in the ancient world. You keep what you like and you change what you don't. All of that information just given is to prepare your mind to think about this question. 
who or what was the author of Isaiah 34 referring to when he used the Hebrew word leleth? Historically speaking, I think there are two viable options, and really, the truth may be a little bit of both. The author of Isaiah 34 likely knew of the story of Lilith, and I'm certain by the mid to late 8th century BCE, which is when most scholars believe 1st Isaiah was written, the story of Lilith was well established throughout the entire Near East. So the author of this biblical passage had to, at the very least, know what mythology he was referring to. The interesting question then becomes, what was the mythology or the cultural understanding of Lilith in Jerusalem in the mid to late 8th century BCE? And that is a much more difficult question to answer. But we can be almost 100% certain that Lilith wasn't seen as the first wife of Adam or the mother of demons yet. That view of Lilith doesn't come for another couple thousand years. At this point in time, and in this geographic location, Lilith probably looked a lot like her Sumerian and especially her Babylonian counterparts, known as the Lilithu. She would have been heavily associated with owls. Lilith, like owls, are creatures of the night. They are also predatory birds, meaning they must hunt and kill other animals to survive. Lilith was no different. She was a creature of the night, believed to snatch people away and kill them, especially babies. So should the Hebrew word leleth used in Isaiah 34 be translated as little owl or Lilith? Well, considering there is another Hebrew word for owl, I think the correct translation is Lilith. And I think that's the mythology that was in mind to the author of Isaiah. But it's still a little bit unclear as to whether or not the author of Isaiah 34 really believed in this mythology or not. Like, did the author really believe that there was an owl-like demoness woman running around in the wilderness? Or did they just use it as a metaphor to try and say that there are bad and evil things lurking out there? Well, unless you've got a time machine, I think this one is always gonna be a mystery. The next source I'd like to focus on for Lilith can be found in the Song of the Sage, a work discovered as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here, Lilith finds her place, pretty definitively as a demon. The text reads, and I, the master, proclaim the majesty of his beauty to frighten and terrify all the spirits of the destroying angels and the spirits of the bastards, the demons, Lilith, the howlers and the yelpers, they who strike suddenly to lead astray the spirit of understanding. This passage is interesting as it gives us insight into the religious thought of an Essene Jewish community living a few decades before the birth of Christ. The author of this work, whoever he might have been, had a more developed theology of Lilith, still slightly associated with owls, given the text says, they who strike suddenly to lead astray, as owls do seem to strike suddenly, but more significantly here, Lilith seems to be more associated with the spirits of the destroying angels and the spirits of the bastards and demons. Moving right along to our next source for Lilith, and that is, the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud is the central text of Rabbinic Judaism, along with the writings of the Hebrew Bible. The Talmud has two parts. The Mishnah, which is the written collection of the Oral Torah, written around 200 CE, and the Gemara, which is a collection of discussions on Jewish law and a harmonization between biblical and rabbinic versions of the law dating between 200 and 500 CE. Lilith first appears in Shabbat 151b, 10 in the Mishnah section of the Babylonian Talmud, which says this, Rabbi Hania said, it is prohibited to sleep alone in a house, and anyone who sleeps alone in a house will be seized by the evil spirit Lilith. Here, Lilith is seen as an evil people-snatching spirit that comes out at night, pretty similar to how Lilith is viewed in our previous sources. Again, kind of like an owl. The next passage about Lilith, also from the Mishnah section of the Babylonian Talmud, comes from Nitta 24b10. Rav Yehuda says that Samuel says, in the case of a woman who discharges a fetus that has the form of a Lilith, a female demon with wings and a human face, its mother is impure with the impurity of a woman after childbirth. It is a viable offspring, only it has wings. So this passage is basically saying that if a woman gives birth to a winged creature in the form of a Lilith, it is considered a viable offspring. This seems a little strange, but notice Lilith here is clearly defined as a female demon with wings and a human face. 
I'd like to pause here for a moment and point out that our first source for Lilith came from Sumerian mythology, and our last four sources have been from the Jewish perspective. But the mythology of Lilith was still circulating in the Mesopotamian area, now called Iraq. And it's in Iraq that we find our next source for Lilith, which is an incantation bowl, which are bowls with magical spells written in them. A particularly interesting incantation bowl can be seen here on the screen. It is written in Aramaic and dates to the late post-Sassanian period, circa 500 to 700 CE. The incantation bowl is a spell in the form of a bill of divorcement from demons and the devil. Here, Lilith appears again, or should I say Liliths. From this incantation bowl, we learn about someone named Bagdana, who is evidently a king of demons and the great ruler of the Liliths. This incantation bowl is designed to ward off the evil spirits and the evil Liliths in the name of the ineffable one, a phrase often used to refer to God. At this point in time, I feel like we have done a good job covering the origins of Lilith, who she was and where she came from in the ancient world. But now, with our next source, we're getting into the more arcane and fantastical stories about Lilith. And this next source is a medieval text titled The Alphabet of Ben Sira. This text is dated sometime between 700 and 1000 CE. This Alphabet of Ben Sira is where the myth of Lilith gets its most popular place in modern culture. It's the story that most people think of when they think of Lilith today. Alphabet of Ben Sira 23, A through B, says, Soon afterward, the young son of the king took ill. Nebuchadnezzar said, Heal my son. If you don't, I will kill you. Ben Sira immediately sat down and wrote an amulet with the holy name, and he inscribed on it the angels in charge of medicine by their names, forms, and images, and by their wings, hands, and feet. Nebuchadnezzar looked at the amulet and said, Who are these angels? Ben Sira replied, the angels who are in charge of healing, Sinoi, Sansinoi, and Semangeloth. When God created Adam, he was alone. Then God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Then he also created a woman from the earth, as he had created Adam, and called her Lilith. Adam and Lilith immediately began to fight about sex. Lilith said, I will not lie on bottom. And Adam says, well, I will not lie on bottom, but only on top. For you are fit only to be on the bottom position during sex, because I am the superior one. Lilith responded, we are equal to each other inasmuch as we are both created from the earth. But they would not listen to one another. When Lilith saw this, she pronounced the ineffable name of God and flew away into the air. Adam stood in prayer before his creator. Sovereign God of the universe, the woman you gave me has run away. And at once God blessed Adam and sent these three angels to bring her back. God said to Adam, if she agrees to come back, what is made is good. If not, she must permit 100 of her children to die every day. The angels left God and pursued Lilith, who they overtook in the midst of the sea, in the mighty waters wherein the Egyptians were destined to drown. They told her God's word, but she did not wish to return. The angel said, We shall drown you in the sea. Leave me be, shouted Lilith. I was created only to cause sickness to infants. If the infant is male, I have dominion over him for eight days after his birth, and if female, for twenty days. When the angels heard Lilith's words, they insisted she go back, but she swore to them by the name of the living and eternal God, whenever I see you or your names or the forms in an amulet, I will have no power over that infant. She also agreed to have 100 of her children die every day. Accordingly, every day 100 demons perished, and for the same reason we write the angels' names on the amulets of young children. When Lilith sees their names, she remembers her oath, and the child recovers. And so here we get the story of Lilith being Adam's first wife. Lilith wasn't created from Adam's rib like Eve was. She was created from the same dirt of the ground that Adam was. Lilith is the Genesis 1 woman. Eve is the Genesis 2 woman. But unfortunately, Lilith and Adam couldn't agree on the proper sex position, so Lilith took off. You could say there was trouble in paradise. 
Oh, terrible joke. Lilith is then seen as the woman or demon who was destined to cause death and sickness to infants, which is how Lilith is seen more and more as time goes on. A demoness who snatches children out of the arms of nursing mothers to kill them. Lilith refuses to come back to Adam, so she makes a deal with these three angels. As long as she sees the names of the angels in an amulet, she won't harm the baby. This story very well could have been originally written as a satire or an ideological story explaining why people write the names of these three angels on their amulets. We know from certain amulets, like the Sefer Razael Hamalak, which is a medieval Kabbalistic textbook of magic, that amulets against Lilith would be worn around the necks of pregnant women or placed in rooms where newborn babies slept. It seems that by the time of the Middle Ages, Judaism's understanding of Lilith really focused on her as being a killer and snatcher of babies and the demoness of infanticide. Lilith's story doesn't end here. She is also mentioned in the Zohar, which is a 12th century work written in Spain and is the introductory text of Jewish mystical literature called Kabbalah. In the Kabbalah, Lilith takes on extraterrestrial powers. Lilith is not only the first wife of Adam, but also the wife of Satan. She is a chaotic counterpart to the feminine divine presence. In the Zohar, the Holy One, or the masculine aspect of the divine, separates from the feminine aspect of the divine and joins with Lilith instead. So Lilith and the Holy One are linked in this evil and chaotic sexual and spiritual relationship that will only be resolved when the Messiah comes and heals the brokenness of the world. So there you have it, the true origins of Lilith. Bonus fact! In America in 2020, Lilith was the 316th most common name for a girl. So that means in 2020 in America, one out of every 1,760 girls born were named Lilith. Stay thirsty for knowledge.